بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت باركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبعد this is the fourth city بعد الحجة الثالثة من العلم and we reach the chapter in seeking knowledge from the Muqtada, the innovator. Seeking knowledge from the Muqtada, the innovator. Now, read. O oh, you seeker of knowledge, if you are in a position of freedom of choice, then do not take from a Muqtada. Be he Rafid, Rafida. Muqtada is an innovator. Someone who has beliefs or practices which have been innovated in the religion and they're not based on what the Prophet and his companions used to do as a group. That's an innovation, something new in the religion. It's called a bid'ah. The one who practices the bid'ah or believes in an innovative belief is called muqtada. So he says, if you are in a freedom of choice, then do not take from a muqtada. Whether he is a rafidi or, now I'm ready to explain. Khariji, Murji, Qadari, Uburi, etc. For you will never reach the level of knowledgeable men, correct in your creed, strong in your association with Allah, with strong vision, and following the tracks except by abandoning the Mubtadi'a and their innovations. The books of Bayah. He says avoid the Mubtadi'a, and the major of them are the Rafid. The Rafid, in English, they translate as the rejectionists. They're the Shia, Shia to Rafu. Why are they called the rejectionists? Because they rejected Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and and the other Sahaba. Not just rejected them, in fact, they cast them. And they take us the religion is to cast those noble companions of the Prophet. And they are from the worst of the people on this planet of earth. The Shia to are from the worst people on the planet of the earth. Hmm. So he says, do not take from them. Do not take from them. Or the Kharijin. The Kharijin is someone who is affected by the fikr of the Khawarij. The Khawarij are those who view a revolting and rebelling against the Muslim leader. It's permissible by any sin he commits. And they are the people who view themselves as the only good Muslims. And everybody else is lost. And they are the people who are quick in making takfir of other Muslims, declaring other Muslims to be kafir, non-Muslim. That's the Kharijin. They are quick to make takfir on other Muslims. So he says, beware of someone who's Kharijin. Now, and the Murji, the Murji is someone who has irja. Al irja <coughs> is to believe that actions are not part of Iman. Al irja is to believe that actions are not part of Iman. Iman, belief. For us Muslims, is belief in the heart, statements of the tongue, and actions of the limbs. And Iman increases and decreases belief, faith. Faith is matters of the heart, the belief which is in the heart. And then you have to proclaim that. And the certain worships which you do with your tongue, like praying, uh, uh, dhikr, reading the Quran, that is part of Iman, belief and actions of your limbs, your praying, you go for Hajj, these are all part of Iman. The Murji of the group who came and said, no, as long as you say, I'm a Muslim, that is it, that is faith. And if you commit any sins, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect your Iman. Because Iman doesn't increase and decrease. Now we say, no, that is wrong. Now, or the Qadari, the Qadari are the people who they rejected the belief in the Qadr, the predestination of Allah, the pre-decree, that everything has been pre-decreed. Everything has been decreed by Allah. The Qadariya are those who came and refused that, rejected that. Now, and then you have the Quburi. The Quburi is someone who goes about worshipping uh, and exaggerating about the people who are buried in the grave. He says, oh, this was a great, great uh, a scholar. He was a great worshipper. So if we go and worship close to his grave, there's blessings there. You understand? 
an Islamic that is not allowed to worship in two places. The cemetery where there's a grave or and on washroom. the washroom. Those are two places you can't wash it. Anywhere else you can do your washing as long as it's clean. Where there's a grave and in a washroom. Why? Because even though sometimes you might say, I don't worship the person who's buried here. I just feel he was someone who's great. He was close to God, to Allah. So he, this place where he's buried is blessed. It's full of blessings. So if I worship close to him also, my worship will be blessed. I'll be blessed. That is not allowed. That is an innovation. Why? Because after that, it leads you to actually worship that person. So he says, beware of the whole world. Also the people who go about grave worshiping. For you will never reach the level of knowledge of Allah. If you sit with this kind of people, you will never get real knowledge. You will never be correct in your creed, in your aqidah, in your association with Allah. You will never be someone with strong vision. And you will never be someone who is following the tracks. The tracks of who? The tracks of who? Ah, the Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, said, you will never be someone who is following their way unless by abandoning the Mubdadi'a and their innovations. Now, <clears throat> the books of biographies and holding fast to the Sunnah are abundant with accounts of Ahl Sunnah finishing off the Mubtadi'a and renouncing their innovation and distancing away from them as a sound, pers as a sound person would distance himself from a sick, diseased person. There are so many stories and accounts that will take a long time to recount, but it gives me pleasure to mention a few of them from the Salaf, for the Salaf used to seek reward with Allah in disregarding them, humiliating them, and rejecting the Muqtadi and his innovation. They also used to warn against becoming associated with them, or seeking their opinion, or eating with them. For the Muqtadi and Sunni should be so far apart that each of them cannot see the fire of the other. <coughs> There were amongst the Salaf those who never used to pray over the funeral of the Muqtadi and, and, would, and would be seen leaving the funeral ceremony. It was also witnessed that Al-Alama Al-Sheikh Muhammad, Al 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 Muhammad ibn, Ibrahim, ibn Ibrahim died 1389, abstained, abstained from funeral prayer over a Muqtadi. Also there were amongst the Salaf those who used to prohibit from praying behind them or mentioning their innovations because the heart is weak and double-fold affairs are swift in abduction. What he means here, Khwani, I'll summarize this subject, because this subject also has been misunderstood. This subject has been misunderstood by many. Hajar al Abandoning and distancing yourself from the innovator or someone who does innovations. The commission here is true, the Shia commission here, staying away from them, disregarding them, that is how it's supposed to be. But Islam is a religion which came with everything has to be balanced with this great principle. If the, if the rewards, the advantages, the benefits are more than the disadvantages, then you do something. If the disadvantages and the evils of that are more than the advantages, then you don't do that. And you can never appreciate that principle unless you get knowledge, then you'll know what to do, when to do. Very important. So in a state where the Ahl Sunnah people of the Sunnah are weak, weaker than the people of innovations, fewer than them, then it is not of wisdom <coughs> to abandon them or to speak bad about them. It is not of wisdom. Because at the end of the day, they are Muslims. What was meant by abandoning them was supposed to be a form of disciplining them so that they come back to the truth. Imagine you live in a town or a city of a hundred thousand people 
80% of them are upon the Sunnah, the correct Aqeedah. You follow the right way. And you have 20% who have innovations. If the 80% decided that we are not going to associate ourselves with this 20%, what do you think will be the reaction of the 20%? They would want to come back and fit into the society, right or wrong? Right or wrong? Huh? Well, you guys are mute, you don't speak. What? You don't speak? Right or wrong? Now what about the opposite? 80% of people, they don't know what even they follow. And only 20% are the ones who follow the Sunnah. Does it make sense for you to say we're going to abandon everybody? No. You understand, and that's how it's supposed to be. In fact, especially like they say, they don't even know what they're following. It's not like they're outrightly innovators, following innovations, no. They're just lost somewhere. They don't know what they follow. Those people, do they deserve you, of you, sorry, to treat them well and bring them to the truth? Or do they deserve of you to say to them, I don't talk to you, I don't sit with you? I'm asking you this question. You, need, you better answer this, because this is happening with you today. It's happening with you today. What do you think is the better way of dealing with that? What would you do, I'm asking you? Is it better for you to say, okay, let us be good to them, let's speak to them so they can come and let's tell them this is what you're doing is wrong, this is the truth. Or we say, no, they're not following the sunnah, they're not coming to our masjid, you know, leave them alone. We don't even give them salam. Which do you think is the better one, the first or the second? First. Huh? The first is the better one? Very good. Now you need to practice that though. Because most of the problems we're facing today, those people who call themselves Salafis, Ahlul Sunnah, this is the problem. And you know, by the way, it's caused by jahl, ignorance. It's all jahl, ignorance. You read one book, a few <coughs> websites, and you think you're on top of the mountain. You know, Sheikh Al-Bani, who all of us agree on, on his degree in status and knowledge in this era. Not two Salafis would disagree, right or wrong, on Sheikh Al-Bani, would they? No. He was asked something close to this. And he said that you should go to the mountain and seclude yourselves. That is the sunnah. He said, go live in a mountain. People are in need of you bringing them to the proper way. You understand? The Prophet ﷺ, he didn't abandon people like that. He said, take me to them. Man yahbillu ila qawmihi liuballiga kalam rabbi. He used to ask the Arabs who came to the Suq Uqad, the marketplace, who is going to take me to his people so I can tell them the words of their Lord? For those who are Kufar, non Muslims, what about a fellow Muslim who's just on another path but he doesn't know or he is just confused by the person he follows? You understand? Hmm. Now, so you'll finish, you'll finish this chapter on your own. Uh, like we said yesterday, some of these chapters you can read on your own. I will just explain for you, get the idea, then you can read inshallah. Now, so when the Ahl Sunnah they are stronger, like what Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim he did, he said, I'm not going to attend the funeral of this person because he was an innovator. Sheikh Muhammad bin Ibrahim was the Mufti, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia. So if someone like that says, I'm not going to his funeral, you know, it's like today, if you had a Muslim prime minister saying, oh, I'm not coming to his funeral. Why? Because he was following this path and that's the path of deviation. You think that others were with that person in the path of deviation will stay in that path or they will at least reconsider? They'll reconsider and say, oh, okay, there's a problem here. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, he used to say what? When someone will be brought, he's dead, to pray for him, the funeral prayer. He would ask what? Huh? He would ask what? Was he indebted? Did he take a loan which he didn't pay before? If they say yes, he'll say, okay, I don't pray on him. 
I don't pray on him, you pray on him, but I will not pray on him. Imagine you living on that time when you want to, to die with a debt, the Prophet will not, will not pray on you. Why to show the greatness of that matter? In Islam, it's a great thing for you to take people's money and not pay them back. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, the Shaheed, the one was martyred, he will not go to paradise unless he pays people's debts. Yes. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, and Nabiyu awla bil mu'mineen amin al-fusim. Surah Al-Ahzab. That the Prophet is closer to the believers than themselves. When that verse was revealed, the Prophet said, Now every Muslim or any Muslim who dies and he doesn't have money, I will pay for him. But before that, he wouldn't pray on someone who, who has a debt. Or, like the scholar would say, someone who kills himself. Someone commits suicide. We say we don't pray on him. So there would be a reason, it would be a lesson. Uh, for who? For the others who are thinking the same way. You understand? If that has benefit, then you do it. If abandoning people has benefit, you do it. And this works for everybody, by the way. Your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband. If you feel, if, okay, I'm not going to speak to him for one day, you know that this is going to make them rethink and rethink and say, okay, I'm not doing this again. Then okay, do that. But if that has no benefit, it's haram for you to do it. Unless you fear for yourself that I can't sit with this person because he might affect me with his innovations. You fear for yourself. Remember the point you mentioned before praying? He said, if you see the shaitan coming, he says, leave the hadith in the Quran and let's talk about what? Dhawq. He said, no, he's a shaitan. So if you're cowardly, you feel he might affect me. He says, run. But if you feel you can sit with him and you can affect him, you have to do that. You have to do that. Now, we go to the next one. The next chapter, Akhi. Chapter 4. The etiquette of companionship. Beware of the bad companion. Now, this is the next chapter, Akhi. Finish the chapter of the etiquettes of you and your Sheikh, the etiquettes of seeking knowledge. And make sure your Sheikh is not someone who's deep into bid'ahs and innovations. That was the last point. Some of the scholars, they made an exception. They said, if you know your religion well, you are firmly grounded. You know your aqidah, your creed well. You are firmly grounded, not just anyone. And there's a certain type of knowledge which you can't find in your Sheikh. Or you don't have someone of the Sunnah in your place, he has that knowledge. But there's someone of innovation who has that knowledge. He says, they say that you can go to him. Because you are firmly grounded, he can't affect you. But even then, some of them said, no, you don't do that. They said, why? They said, because someone who doesn't understand might come and see you and say, what? Oh, if so and so sits with you, then he means it's okay. You understand? You get deceived. Uh, no. Number four, now the Sheikh mentions the etiquette of a companion, companionship. When you come to study, who are you sitting with? After you study, you want to be a student of knowledge. These are the man manners. Who are your friends? What demand them? You show me your friends, I can tell you exactly what kind of a person you are. You show me your friends, I can tell you. You understand? That is one of, one of the great ulama, I forgot his name Allah. They used to blame him, they say, we don't see you, you just seclude yourself. Why don't you sit with us? And he says, I have the best friends at home. I have the best friends at home. He said, who? He said, the Sahaba, the companions. He said, are you crazy? He said, no. I have all the books I want at home. It's, it's as if I'm sitting with the Sahab, with them, the companions. And they said the book, Khairu Jalis, the best friend. You know why? Because the book will not judge you wrongly. And the book will not curse you and backbite you. You understand, it's the best friend. 
He says, beware of the bad companion. He says, and this is psychology. He says, just as the hereditary disposition is hidden, bad characteristics are also hidden. He says, character is transferable. And impressions are major abductors of the heart. And people are like the flocks of birds. A group of birds is called a flock. You are naturally disposed to imitating one another. That's how we are human beings. So beware of associating with whosoever is to this liking. For this is indeed destruction and privation is better than cure. If you can avoid those bad friends, privation is better than cure. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us the best example. He said, The example of a good friend and a bad friend. Someone who sells misk. You know what misk is, right? The best smelling fragrance of this one, musk. He says, Imma ayyuhdi ilayk. Either he'll give you a gift, some of the misk, and you'll smell good. Or if he doesn't give it to you, he carries it out of him all, all the time. You will smell good also, just like he smells good. You'll get some of the good smell scent. As for the bad friend, is someone who he blows in the bellows, is what they call him. You saw it on TV, I'm sure. The iron smith, you know the iron smith is someone who works with iron. When they have the fire, you know the thing they blow with? It's called the bellows in English. It's called, you understand? The thing that, he says the bad friend is like the iron smith. He's just working with iron, you know, he's on the iron has to be put on fire. You've seen that before, right or wrong? He said either he'll burn your clocks, or you'll smell like smoke. Allahu Akbar. Can, can it become clearer than that? If you don't become just like him, you will take something from him. Yes? You cannot deny that human beings are like that. What do you think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this? And what do you think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? Everybody will be upon the religion of his closest friend. If your friend, his religion is just he prays Friday to Friday only, guaranteed in a few weeks you'll be like him. If your friend is someone who's about that knowledge, you know, okay, we need to revise today. You need to finish this lecture. We need to go pray. You will be like him. He said, So let each one of you look who is he taking as his friends. That's the address of the Prophet. Huh? It's very important. You don't see those people who dream of seeking knowledge. They're just dreaming. Dreaming of seeking knowledge. But he's not ready to get up and stop watching basketball to go to the class. He's not ready for that. That's not your friend. If you see him once a month, okay, but that's your friend, you'll become like him. Mm. And he mentions the types of friends. He said there's a friend who you who befriends you solely for his welfare. He's friendly to you because he wants something from you. I think all of us know about those ones, right? Without mentioning names, huh? Huh? And if she marries you, then she's called a gold digger. Right or wrong? That's what she's called. You have male gold diggers also. You know, you get married to this woman because she's a millionaire. 90% of us will do that, yeah? She's 68 years old, she'll die soon, you know, I'll be there in <laughs> So these brothers, they, 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 they dream like that. I met one of those brothers, he said, Sheikh, you know, 
uh, I'm looking for my Khadija. It's a common saying in Philadelphia, in the States. Actually, I met one of the brothers in Egypt who was telling me that. I'm looking for my Khadija. What do you mean? What does that mean? He said, you know how the Prophet ﷺ got married to Khadija and she was older but she was rich? I'm looking for my Khadija also. What a loser, man. <laughs> don't get a job. Like seriously, don't get a job. Huh? So he says there's a friend who he befriends you just because he wants benefits from you. And this is material benefit, you know, that he wants to learn from you, know, material benefit. And then there's a friend who befriends you just for fun. He is a good friend. But all you do is just hang out and chill out and that's it. There's no knowledge benefit, there's no even uh, material benefit between the two of you. He's just a good person to chill with. And then there's a friend who befriends you for virtue. Because you benefit from him or he benefits from you. Ilm, other manners. He makes you a better person, you make him a better person. You understand? Those are the three kinds of friends. He says, look for the third one. And he said, the third one today is someone who's a hard currency. Someone rare. Nadi. Someone rare. Huh? And Hisham bin Abdul Malik, rahimahullah, he said, nothing remains of the worldly pleasures today except a brother who I raised the burden of taking precaution between me and him. He said, there's nothing better today of enjoyment of the dunya than a friend who I know, I don't have to be so cautious with him. If I do wrong, he will correct me. If I need something, he will give me. If, I need, if he needs something, I will give him. That is the friend. You understand? And the Salaf, they used to say, he is not your friend. The one who sees you making a mistake and he cannot tell you. Ah, you need to correct this. He says, that's not your friend. And then Hassan al-Basri said, Bi'sa al-Sadiq, the worst friend, alladhi tatlu minhu dua The one you have to ask him, make dua for me. He said, that's the worst friend. If he was a real friend, he'd be making dua for you. You don't have to tell him. You understand? Choose who you befriend. All right. If you have one good friend, that's enough. Most of you are young, maybe you don't comprehend this. Like, you know, I need to be around them. No, you don't need to. Choose one good friend, two or three, who you can move forward in your life, both in the deen and the dunya. They make you a better person. That's what you need. That's what you need now. The next chapter he says is the etiquette, the man is the of the student of knowledge in leading a life of knowledge now. You have known these are the manners, now how do you continue upon this? Starting is easy, continuing it. Now he says number one is what? High aspirations in knowledge. Ulul Himma. Ulul Himma. He says it's one of the characteristics of Islam, not just knowledge. Islam, the people who passed by us, they became great people because of the Himam they had. They had high aspirations. I told you yesterday, I'm going to say again, look to your right. Look there. Khwani, you're not looking. Look. Those books were written by human beings just like me and you. Like I said, no, not time, they were written by hand. In times they didn't have electricity, they had put, to put on a lamp. They didn't have ready-made pens, they had to buy ink. They wrote all of that. I told you, it's a mission to read it. It's a mission. Each more of that was 24, 26 volumes. It's a mission, each volume is 400 pages. You do the math. Do the math, that's 10,000 pages. How long will it take you to read? How many pages can you read in a day? Tell me, I'm asking you. 
You don't have to understand say Sheikh is private, that's fine with me. How many pages can you read in one hour, sir? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sheikh Ashur will start with you because you're the youngest, right? I oh, am. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How many pages do you read in an hour? You always gain yourself per hour. Just like when you drive, say 60 kilometers per hour, you have to know how many pages do you read in an hour. I know my speed, I'm not saying it. Ashu. Random, approximately, in an hour, how many pages do you read? Approximately 20 to 30 pages. MashaAllah, khair. Whatever it is, it could be different. English for you is the highway, Arabic is the noble roads, khair. <laughs> you know? Okay. English or Arabic? Or both? Both. Khair. Akhi. 30, 40 pages. MashaAllah. Ah, who was? Yeah, 30, 40. Approximately. I'm sure none of you have tested yourself before. Have you timed yourself before? You have? No. Anybody has done that? Anybody? You have to do that. See me, alhamdulillah. I'm sharing this with you so you can understand this. When I go pick up any book, first thing I read the title, I look, okay, and then I see how many pages is this? And I know next week I'll be done. That's how I break it down, because this week I'll have five hours, so okay, I can finish this. Or this book will take me three months. I know myself, this is how much I can read, and this is how much time I will have. I'm coming here to you, I don't have time to read now. So if you tell me how many pages you read since I came here, I can't say actually. Huh? How many do you think you can read? You, I end. <laughs> Test yourself. Good result. On a good day? On a good day. Very good. That is good. Akhi? Test. What's your name, Akhi? Abdul Rashid, mashallah. I'm Andim. It's very important. Because once you know, then you have to tell yourself, okay, I have to do better. Shaykh, do you know how many pages the one chapter of Quran? Give one chapter of Quran here. A juz? A juz has 20 pages. So this is a good question. Yes, one juz of the Quran is 20 pages. How long does it take you to read one juz? 15 minutes, mashallah. That's very good. That is very good. If it takes you 15 minutes, that is very good. It shouldn't take you more than half an hour. It shouldn't take you more than half an hour. If it does, you have to. And all of these things are holy, they come with practice. That is where you build your himma. <clears throat> I'm telling you, if I was here, I would come here every day and look at these books and say, Allahu Akbar. I have to read. But then I ask myself, these people, how did they write all this stuff? <laughs> you know, they didn't have references and they didn't go to a library where they have everything laid out and they were copying and pasting. No. Those people, how did they write that stuff? He told you the himam they have. I told you yesterday, Imam Nawawi rahimahullah, he died, he was barely 40 years old. al Majmur is a book of, he did around 16 volumes, if I'm not wrong, or 14 volumes. He wrote the whole explanation of Sahih Muslim, al bin Hajj. He wrote Riyad al-Salihin, and other books. Al-Imam ibn Jarir al-Tabari, the greatest Mufassir, was the greatest compilation of Tafsir, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari. During his time, by the way, uh, it was a madhab by itself to follow al-Tabari. That's how great he was. It's like people today follow Shafi'i, Malik. He was an imam like that at tabari He told his companions, why don't you write a book on Tafsir? And we compile all the statements of the Tabi'een and the Sahaba. They told him, are you crazy? How long will that take you? He said, okay. And he started. They said he used to write 12 pages a day. If I'm not wrong. The tafsir of Atabari Khan is 18 volumes. 
And then he told me, why don't you write a book on the seerah? Like everything which has happened, we should write it down. They said, you're crazy. Who will write that and who can read that? And he has the biggest book of seerah today. Tariq al umwal wal and he was the youngest of them. Those two books, if you try to read them, take you a good two, three years if you slow read like that. But he wrote all of that. Why? The aspirations were high. Imam al Nawawi said, like I said, he says, I used to have 12 classes in a day. I go to this shaykh, he teaches me Nahu Arabic. I go to this shaykh, I learn fiqh. I go to this shaykh, I learn and, and, and. 12 classes a day. You may think, wow. No, it's not wow. You do that university already. You do that in your high school already. How many classes you have in a day? You're in high school? Where are you at? College. How many classes you have in a day? Two or three. If you can do that with ilm of human beings, knowledge which is not taking you to Jannah, be sure you can do that with knowledge which is coming from Ar-Rahman. Because this one is simpler and easier for the heart. Yes? You understand? Imam al-Bukhari, uh, Zad al-Ma'ad. When Zad al-Ma'ad, they saw it? Zad al-Ma'ad, can you bring it? Bring it, please. Al Imam al-Qayyim, all of us, we know him. But this book is one of the greatest books in Islam, period. One of the greatest books of understanding the life of the Prophet It's not just seerah, it's seerah with fiqh. Ibn al-Qayyim, he wrote it on his journey to Hajj. He had no references. He said, I didn't bring my books with me. Put it here so the camera can see it. He said, I didn't have my references. La kid. He wrote this from his heart. Khalli, khalli. They just have it on the camera and then you take it away. You see that? He wrote it while traveling on a camel, not in a van. <laughs> he can stretch his legs. Not on a plane. He, didn't, he says it himself. I didn't have my references. Allahu Akbar. Why, Yashwan? There are people who had him up aspirations. They had real aspirations and I'm taking Zakalakha. That is Zad al-Ma'ad. It is in English also. If you can get this book, you have to get it. They translate it into the provisions of the hereafter. The provisions of the hereafter. That's what they call it in English. Very important book. These are important things you have to know. Like I said, when you learn, then you know. I told you yesterday, the man who I know, I live with, he doesn't read or write, he can't, yet he memorizes the whole Quran. By the way, for those of you who are old, during the summer, there used to be classes for women who are at home, the mothers, the most busy people, with the kids and, and like I told you, those people who are farmers. And most of them, they are ummiyya, they cannot read or write. Yet in three, four weeks, they know what I saw at Yasin. Hima, aspirations. Aspirations. Al Imam al Bukhari, he wrote his book in how many years? 16 years. He's writing Sahih al Bukhari. Can you imagine that? And the Sheikh tells you, come here Saturday after Dhuhr and Sunday after Dhuhr, and you show up after Asr. Can you write or stay in a lesson for 16 years? 16 years. So, when you read the seer of these people, Ikhwani, it drives up your head. You say, okay, I need to follow these people. You understand? It's very important. You have to have high aspirations. Every human being needs that. Now, he says that you have to, <coughs> you have to have the blood of endurance 
it will flow in your veins. Al Imam Al Zuhri said, "Ikhwan, in this knowledge, la yustata'u bi rahat al jism badan." This knowledge, you want to become someone, you can't do it by just leaping around. You just lay around. You can't. It's impossible. You have to feel the hardship a bit. You have to feel the hardship. Now. And he says, do not confuse high aspiration with pride. It's not pride, it's not kibble. If you're someone who has high goals, it doesn't mean you're someone who is arrogant. No? Just because the difference between them is like the difference between the heavens that give rain and the earth which splits. High aspiration is the adornment of the inheritance of the prophets. That's high aspiration. Well, pride is the sickness of those who are sick. They're two different things. I told you yesterday about uh, Abdullah bin Zubair, radiallahu anhu, uh, sorry, Abdullah bin Abbas. How he used to go and sit at the door of his teacher. Who is this teacher? Huh? Zaid ibn Thabit, mashaAllah. And he would come out, he would come out to say, Why were you sitting here? You're the cousin of the Prophet. He'd say, No, I, need, I cannot come and knock on your door. I don't know, maybe you're resting. Yes, I'm here to seek knowledge. You would sit there at his door. And that is high aspirations. And to show high aspiration is not kibr, arrogance. He says, What? He sits on the floor. Even who said he is better than Zayd because he's from the cousin of the Prophet of his Ali You understand? And then he said what? Zayd, the other day he came and he kissed his hand. He kissed Ibn Abbas's hand. And Ibn Abbas is supposed to be his student. He said why? He said because you're the family of the Prophet This is what we've told to, to do. High aspiration without kibbal. You have to have high goals. Don't let your goal be, yeah, I want to read Surah Thalat. That's it. Surah Thalat is good. But you do that in one day. It's one day's job. You're done. You understand it one day. That's it. With a good explanation, it's one day. Yeah, I want to memorize one Jews of the Quran. No, that's it. You need to memorize the whole Quran. Even if you don't get there, you, you don't get there at least, you got somewhere. You should never be someone who has lowly ambitions. Yeah, I just want to flip burgers at McDonald's. But no, it's not the Muslim. Muslim, you should say, you know what, I want to be the one who invents the new rocket which goes to space with water. It should be us. You understand? It should be us. Now, the whole religion of Khwani is by high aspirations. The next point he mentions is, you have to have the burning desire for knowledge. You have to love this thing called knowledge. Shaykh Muqbin ibn Wadi'i rahimahullah, he used to say, Wallahi, this knowledge we are seeking is more beloved to us than the most beautiful women and all the gold and silver. And if they brought all the gold and silver, never leave seeking knowledge. And that is very true. Once you get the love of seeking knowledge, oh, that is why the wife of, uh, is it Shu'ba? Shu'ba ibn Hajjaj Abu Bistam, one of the greatest scholars of hadith again. Huh? The first person studied the ilm of Jarh Adil to say this person don't take hadith from him. Shu'ma. He used to be in Kufa. They used to say they came to his wife one day. And they said, MashaAllah, Imam Shu'ma, he never got married to a second wife. It's good for you. She said, Awadhu Billah. These books of his are worse than four wives. <laughs> These books he spends time with, they're worse than other three wives that you would have. 
because the love of knowledge is in his veins already. It's flowing in his veins. That's all he is thinking of. Like how all some of you all you're thinking of is the game tonight. I don't know who's playing tonight. I'm just giving an example. All you're thinking of is oh that restaurant you love to eat in. All you're thinking of is the video game you play. It needs to be knowledge. I'm telling you, there's nothing sweeter than that. Well, why? There's nothing sweeter than that. That your comfort and your relaxation, your enjoyment, is when you sit and you listen to a lecture and you read a book. Allah Akbar. That is Jannah. That is paradise. <coughs> that is paradise. Now, it says, so have the desire of seeking knowledge. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib he said, the worth of every person is in that which he is good at. The worth of every person. If you have to know how worthy are you, what is your level, it is by what are you good at. Yes, I know a bit of this and a bit of that, you're just someone who's a bit. Or you're someone who say, yes, I am firmly grounded, alhamdulillah, in aqeed, and fiqh, and hadith, and usul, and arabiya, and, and, uh, and mechanical uh, uh, engineering, and physics, and math. that is your worth. Your worth is not money. Because there's always someone who has money more than you. And that money, if you, you cannot work with a billion dollars, can you? Can't. And you will leave it or it will leave you. But knowledge is in your heart. That is how much you are worth. So everybody is worth what he is good at. You might say, yes, I want to be a student of knowledge, and, and, and. But if you are still lagging behind, that's how much you are worth. Never forget that. I think that's enough of, a, of an inspiration. Uh -huh. And he says, and do not listen to the people who say, uh, the predecessors, those who passed by us, they left nothing for us who came after. He said, don't listen to that. In fact, you should say what? <coughs> they left so much for us to do. Some people, they have this idea, oh, what can we do? Everything is done. Bukhari and Muslim, no, no, no. There's so much for you to do. So much for you to do. Now, 